Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our uh, Power Hour alumni interview series. My name is Brad Richards, and I'm Associate Director of Student and Young Alumni Programs at Wharton. I'm honored to introduce our incredible alum, Eduardo Luz, today, as well as Wharton's very own Mary Ellen Lamb. Eduardo is Zone President of Heinz North America, and while leading the North American business, Eduardo's focus is on driving greater scale for his customers while increasing efficiencies across the Heinz business. Before coming Zone President in January of 2014, he was Managing Director of Heinz North America's consumer products. Prior to that, Eduardo was CEO of Flora, a Brazilian CBG company. And prior to Flora, uh, Eduardo was in charge of personal care division in Unilever's business in Brazil, and has also held a number of positions at AB InBev in Europe. Eduardo got his MBA at the Wharton School in 2002, and he and his family live in Pittsburgh. Uh, moderating today's uh, Power Hour is Mary Ellen Lamb. As Deputy Vice Dean, Mary Ellen leads both MBA career management and admissions and financial aid in identifying and providing services and support to enhance the student experience from admissions to graduation and beyond. So without any further ado, let's get started with Power Hour. Can I get a great big Wharton welcome? Eduardo Luz, Mary Ellen Lamb. Thank you all for being here today, and thank you so much for you. coming to Philadelphia for this. We really appreciate your being here. And I think the first thing that I wanted to ask you about was um, your memories of being back on campus. We got to speak briefly outside a little bit about how campus has changed for you, but what's, what are some of your most memorable experiences here at Wharton? All right, so guys, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be uh, back here. It's been, it's been 12 years. Uh, I, I didn't, uh, didn't come back since I graduated here. Funny enough, and uh, it feels feels like home to be honest. Uh, of course, Hudson Hudson Hall is there. Uh, you know, I saw I saw people breaking the champagne of this new building uh, back in 2002. Uh, but I never entered the building, so it was uh, it was great to be back. Um, look, uh, 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 it, it feels like home because the the, the experience that I had here uh, in two years were so incredible to me to my uh, you know to the person that I became and the, the person that I am today in terms of uh, I, I had never been exposed until I came here uh, to such a, you know, uh, uh, environment of excellence, right? I grew up in Brazil. I mean, from a, you know, humble family in Brazil. Uh, and uh, Brazil, when I was growing up, was a very closed uh, country, right? It was, you know, exiting a dictatorship, things like that, right? You come here. And the level of, uh, of the peers and the people that you find out here, it's, it's so high, right? It kind of pushes you, you know, to, to, to your limits, right? And that's the beauty of this, right? You, you, you share experiences and you become a better, you know, person, better professional. So I guess that's, that's the feeling. That's great. Um, when you think back over the 12 years since you've been here, um, have your memories, do you think your memories of the school have changed or the things that you, one of the things I hear from students all the time is, why do we have to learn X? You know, I'm in this class and why do I have to know, right? They're snickering, why do I have to learn this? Are there things like that that have come to you as you've had that number of different roles in different countries and experiences that you, things you learned here that you didn't realize you were gonna need? Look, I, I, I remember very vividly some, um, some courses and professors, right? I, I, I was talking to Marcelo. Uh, um, I had a, pro, a pricing professor called Professor Rajo. Uh, the guy was outstanding, I'm telling you. And, uh, you know, you got, yeah. I mean, bec because uh, it's a very tough subject, right? Uh, when you think about that, right? It, it, it deals with uh, human behavior and how you model that. And the way that professor uh, could simplify, you know, very complex issues, and present alternatives, and help you to structure your thinking. That that stays with you somehow, right? Uh, you 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 leave this place, and I keep coming back mentally to those discussions. Funny enough, I was his teaching assistant uh, uh, on pricing, and you know, in the middle of a discussion about you know what to do with price of you know ketchup, in this case, right? And Professor Raju comes back. Right, it's 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 interesting. Um, 
So no, I, I, I don't think uh, when I was here, there, there was nothing that I uh, said, ah, this is you know, useless, etc. Uh, I think time was well spent, but uh, definitely some of the things, uh, they kind of uh, stick with you for, uh, and for good use. That's great. Um, so when we think about uh, your career, especially your, your role at Heinz now, um, one of the things we talk about a lot here at Wharton is innovation. Um, and how, how do you see innovation um, impacting Heinz? What are some of the challenges that you face with that? What are some of the great successes you've had around innovation? Okay. Yeah, look, uh, on any consumer goods business, right, uh, we're not different. Uh, innovation is uh, one of the core competencies that you need to have uh, to stay relevant, right? Um, you know, it's cliche, but it's true. Uh, out there, the consumer is uh, changing behaviors very quickly, right, uh, and fragmenting. So innovation means that uh, you stay relevant, right, to whatever audience you want to, to reach. Th the way we define that there at Heinz um, is uh, we, we decide to, to, to identify what we call their uh, circumstances of struggle, right? So meaning that uh, situations or solutions that, uh, you know, that fell, fall short of uh, delivering whatever the consumer wants to get out of the experience, right, product or service. And we believe that we, we, we are clear enough and you know, uh, assertive enough on, uh, on uh, articulating the circumstance of struggle, we will come up with solutions to fulfill that circumstance and reduce the struggle. Um, easy to say, hard to do, right? Because the market is you know, flooded with uh, solutions and alternatives, etc. right? So how you put yourself on the, on the shoes of the consumer uh, and try to understand how you can serve them better, right? Uh, that's the challenge. So that's how we will approach it there. Uh, it's extremely exciting, exciting times to be in the industry, to be honest, because, um, you know, uh, as much as it's challenging for established brands, which is our case in some brands, right? The opportunity to grow uh, in different segments, in different uh, you know audiences, Hispanics, millennials, boomers, etc. It's 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 staggering. The opportunity out there is is incredible, right? You just have to be very close to consumers to try to uh, to understand, uh, and then act fast, right? Uh, the fast uh, part of this is also important because uh, you know soon enough people will catch up, right? You know because the market is uh, you know uh, you, you expose yourself in a shelf, right? So you know. In any week, anyone can see what you're doing, copy, right? So how you do that fast and consistently so that people don't catch you so fast? So it, it is a fascinating dynamics to me, and uh, you know that's one of the reasons why I love this industry. I love to be in this kind of business, the branding business, right, the innovation business. Right. And how does that work on a global scale when you look at innovating? And you just described different generational. Um, groups that you're thinking about, how does it work globally? How, how do you think about that? And having as many international roles as you've held, how has it changed for you? It, it's funny because depending on the category, right, um, things travel, uh, uh, you know, easier or harder, right? Uh, in my experience, um, food and beverages, they don't travel well, right? Uh, tastes are very much local uh, still, right? So. Uh, you know, uh, I worked many years on the beer industry, uh, working for ABI. And uh, guys, as much as we have uh, like, uh, you know, global brands, et cetera, try to have global brands, uh, the local brands really rule everywhere, right? Why? Because your taste bud gets used to something, right? And you want more of that. And uh, so in the food industry, right, uh, uh, you know, the, the challenge is to, you know, how you get to that, you know, first experience ahead of the other guy. Okay. So that those taste buds get used to, uh, you know, the high ketchup, luckily, right? Um, so from a, from a product perspective, depends on the category, but uh, it's hard to transfer uh, mm -hmm. one, one, you know, uh, taste or profile from one place to the other. From a communication perspective, uh, then I think that's different, right? Uh, uh, I, I believe in fundamental human truths that uh, if you touch correctly, you can talk to anyone, right, in any part of the globe, right? Uh, if, you, if you say things that resonate from a human truth perspective, 
um, my experience is that you can have the same message as powerfully as in you know, US or you know, Brazil, Japan, etc. as some brands are doing uh, globally right now. Um, so, but I'm responsible, I, I'm responsible for North America, so it's an easier challenge than this right, global challenge right. for now. So how do you define success for a brand? What is, you know, is it, is it purely sales? Is it recognition? How do you define success? Well, we, you know, at, at times we have, uh, you know, we, we are a little bit uh, uh, fanatic for KPIs, right? We, uh, we believe that we, if we don't measure it, uh, you know, it's, it's... It doesn't exist. It's, <laughs> it's a little bit uh, fluffy to our, to our taste, right? Um, so the obvious metrics, right? Market share, you know, uh, brand equity, all that. But, uh, you know, we, we believe that a successful brand, in the end of the day, uh, the asset test is pricing power, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if the brand is real, really strong, right, this brand should command a price premium versus the next competitor or versus, you know, private label, etc. And if it's not commanding pricing power, if this pricing power cannot be extended over time, right, then we see a problem with the brand that we have to try to address, right? Um, so we define that uh, simply as you know, market share, the equity attributes that we may be measuring, and, 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 and pricing power. Very good. And so I guess then the, the follow-on to that is, uh, when, you, when you look at some of the brands, like what are some of the things that are changing them or changing the industry the most rapidly? Oh, wait, look, every brand is a, is a is a story, to be honest, and it's fascinating. Oh, you know, I can tell, I can talk for hours about uh, our brands. I'll give an example about the Heinz brand, right? Uh, you know, uh, the Heinz brand in this country in the U.S. is is really a, a, a ketchup brand. People associate with ketchup, right? Um, uh, ketchup is the mo the favorite uh, condiment in this country by by miles, right? Comparing to you know any other thing, right? Mustard, mayo, ketchup is the thing. Highest penetration, highest repeat, etc. However, um, you know, where do you go from here, right? You know, 45% household penetration in a given year. Uh, you know, uh, almost, you know, everybody at some point in a given year uh, will consume some, etc. How will you grow this category? How will you grow this brand, right? Mm -hmm. um, then we decide to say, okay, let's, let's think differently, right? Let's, um, let's think about ketchup, but not as, uh, you know, as traditionally you would think about catch, which is, yeah, the family sitting there, having a dinner together in Seattle. Let's think about um, flavor experiences. You know, how, how we bring new flavors, right, and put that on top of ketchup, right? And, and flavors uh, is huge for this generation, right? You guys, you guys want to, to taste new stuff, right? So we, we done something that was uh, uh, strange uh, to many people last year we came up with uh, flavor ketchups, right? Mm -hmm. And we, you know, the research said, you know, that could work, we didn't know for sure, we decided to try. It is amazing, amazing what's happening, right? Uh, you, you see the, um, again, the KPIs, right? You see the households increasing uh, behind flavor ketchup and, and, and exciting flavors, right? You know, ketchup with uh, jalapeno, with balsamic flavors, with sriracha uh, coming next year. Um, and then you see the category growing again, right? Behind new users, right? So uh, it's the same story, right? How you find opportunities that are untapped, mm -hmm. the circumstances of struggle, right? So I want to have ketchup, but it's an old flavor, you know, it's a flavor for kids. However, I, li I like the texture, I like the brand. How you offer something new or different to, to those consumers. And, you know, luckily in this case it's working. Yeah. Uh, but it's a learning for every brand. Every brand is different. Every brand is, uh, is a different story. So culturally, I would think that would probably create some, maybe create some conflict within the organization of the traditionalists who have been on, <laughs> yeah. you know, traditional ketchup for a long time. And how do you manage that kind of cultural change? And, you know, is that, is that an issue within the industry? Is it an issue within Heinz? And how does... You know, as a leader, how do you manage through some of that? Look, the, the, the person in charge of the um, ketchup uh, franchise, Heinz franchise, uh, in this case, she's uh, it's a lady. She's uh, 29 years old, 
right? She's not a word on red, nobody's perfect, but you know. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> um, so it, it's a very new perspective on the brand, right? Uh, of course, you know, she's American, she grew up with ketchup, mm -hmm. but uh, her mandate is to challenge the status quo, right? Because we have to grow the ketchup. In that case, we are the leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, how you do that, right? Where you find the circumstances of struggle uh, to grow the ketchup. So we, we deal with those conflicts internally well, right? Uh, uh, we try to put the right people to manage the right parts of the business. On the, on, on the consumer side, it's, it's, it's not an issue. We, 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 we try not to polarize. We're just offering right. new stuff, right? So, you know, doesn't it be or, it could be and, right. or on top. So, it's so far, so good. That's great. So, let's talk a little bit about managing, management. Can you give us a sense of what your management team is like, its size, what their responsibilities are, what, you know, how sure. do you lead, that kind of thing? Sure. So, so you know, I, I'm in charge of, you know, North America, which is basically US and Canada, right? Uh, is a cross-functional team, as you can imagine. Right now, I have too many direct reports. I have uh, 14 direct reports, wow. which I don't recommend. <laughs> it's, uh, it's too many, right? I, I, um, we, uh, we, we, uh, we are operating without a chief marketing officer, so I'm, I'm doubling the, uh, the role there. So I have the, the brand building team reporting to me. So this is temporary, right? So I should have roughly you know, seven, eight direct reports. Um, and what we do to manage the business, right, is, is, a, is a vast business. We, we try to be very organized around uh, a cadence, right? So we meet every Monday. Uh, every Monday from 3 to 5, we'll be together, or everybody, right? Not the 14, but uh, the 8. Uh, and we track KPIs every week, right? Uh, I joke with my guys that... Um, uh, some of our competitors, they, uh, they review their businesses uh, four times a year, right, every quarter. Uh, we review our business 104 times a year, every Monday, every Friday, wow. right? Yeah. Uh, and we do that in a very organized way, right? Uh, so we, if there's a set of KPIs that we track uh, per area, right? You know, you name it, uh, right. supply chain, marketing, sales, etc. And we track. And uh, whatever is deviating, we try to understand why. Okay. Uh, the paradigm is very simple. It's, you know, we believe that uh, the sooner we understand where something is going strange, right? Mm -hmm. Could be good, could be bad, right? But usually it's bad. <laughs> then you act very fast right. uh, on this. Um, so it, it was a little bit of an adjustment uh, for some of the, uh, the leaders there. But uh, the moment they see uh, the results of this cadence, on the day-to-day, -day and how you can leap ahead of your competitors, uh, people try to embrace that. You know, the, the, the consumer goods, guys, uh, in my experience at least, is a, is a game of inches, right? The, the difference between the brand and the person who will win in a given year and lose is, is minimal, right? Um, so we try to find every edge that we possibly can to, to be ahead, you know, on, right. on the right way. What, I guess, the... the the next question that I want to go to is talking a little bit more about your leadership style. And can you give us an example of a tough decision that you've had to make and how you executed on that um, and how you kind of meet those challenges when there are tough decisions to be made? Maybe it's around KPIs or around something bigger, but when those things come up, how do you manage that? Look, uh, uh, you know, usually the tougher decisions about uh, when you have to decide something about people, right? Right. Um, it's just tough because it's about people, right? Um, so those times when you, you realize that you have to move on and uh, you know, give a very direct feedback or even part ways with people, uh, that's the harder part, yeah. right? Because you, you want people to succeed, <laughs> right? And you do everything you can to achieve that, right? Apart from that, uh, from people discussions, um, uh, you know, uh, guys, uh, when you are managing a business and um, what I tell, you know, every time when I meet people like yourselves, right, who one day will be managing a business, or if you already managed a business on the, on before coming to business school, you know, data can tell you only so much, right? Again, we're fanatic by KPIs right. and data, right? But there's an, there's an art and science on this, right? So in the end, when you have to make a tough call on the business, you cannot be 100% sure, right? There, there's an element of... Uh, you know what, common sense, or even gut feel, 
sometimes. And sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong, right? You have to accept that and move on, right? right. And continue to, uh, to move on, right? So um, to me, the best business decisions when you face uncertainty, right? You know what you're facing. You know the amount of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, guts or judgment you're putting into the decision, and it works, right? That's beautiful, right? right? Um, um, when it doesn't, we be, you know, sure that uh, on that Monday, <laughs> Three to five, we'll be yeah. looking at what's happening and reacting, right? Uh, right? If it's not going according to what we planned. That's great. Um, when you think about leadership as well, I think you know a lot of times what we see in the media and what we hear um, are the things that make the big headline, usually on the downside. It's usually some kind of negative news. <laughs> um, what are some of your proudest moments as a leader, even if they're small? Like, what are some of the proudest moments that you've had that maybe didn't get noticed in the media and didn't get? aren't part of your bio that somebody reads out when you come to give a lecture? I, I, well, look, I, I'm, hap I'm happiest when I see uh, our people succeeding, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, when, when I see, uh, you know, us putting, putting people on tough positions because giving big responsibilities, right? We, we, we believe in being, you know, putting bets on people, right? I was mentioning the lady who runs the catch up for us, you know, there are more experienced people in the industry that you can bring on, right? We believe that person is such a high potential, right? Such, such a capable individual in that case that we put the Heinz brand, the Ketchu brand, right, which is the core of the company uh, for her to manage. When a person like that succeeds, right, uh, it, you know, it's the best feeling possible, right? Uh, um, but also, you know, when, when you see someone recovering from Failure, right? And, and trust me, guys, uh, failure is part of the game, right? You know, I, I joke with my guys that uh, if every day we are taking, you know, 51% good decisions and 49% bad decisions, we're in good shape, right? Uh, we're, we're better off. Uh, uh, you, you have to accept that we, you will uh, do bad calls. That's part of the, this thing because it's arts and science. It really is sometimes. Um, the key question is how you rebound. Right? How you notice that this thing is not exactly according to what you planned and what you do to course correct. So sometimes the course correction, the rebound, is even more uh, fulfilling in that sense, right? Because, you know, the, the harder the way sometimes is the best way, right? Uh, so for me, it's a joy also to, to come to, be, to work and be able to do that sometimes. It's great. It really comes through how much you care about your people. It's like, it's nice to see that as you, uh, as you talk about this. When you think about your people, how much does work and life come into how you manage, um, maybe on the firm-wide level or in your group specifically? Um, how do you think about work and life together? Look, uh, uh, you know, every plane people ask me this question is uh, uh, the, the honest answer is uh, I, I don't know. I, I know what works for me, right? Uh, um, I, I, you know, uh, I seriously doubt, guys, companies that come and say, look, uh, I'll take, I take care of your balance for you. How, how do they know my balance, right? You know, uh, people are different, right? So to me, uh, to me, I, I would like to be part of a company who respects different styles, mm -hmm. right? You know, there is this guy who works 18 hours a day and uh, he's very, very happy, you know, but that's his life. Mm -hmm. And there's this person who just have a kid, a baby, and uh, she has to be home at, uh, at five. As long as we can respect this, right, and accommodate, and measuring people by what they should be measured, which is, you know, their consistent results over time, right? And in our case at Heinz, uh, adherence to a set of values uh, that we believe in, and they're very simple values, um, you know, that, that should be fine. Yeah. Right, you know, so I know what works for me, and I try to give the freedom and the leeway uh, for my people to find out what works for them, right? Yeah. And, and just do it. You don't have to tell me that you have to leave at uh, four to pick your kids at school. I don't have to know, right? right? I, I assume that you're doing your job, and in the end, we're leaving our results, right? It, it should be normal, right? Um, it's funny, one of my 14 direct reports, <laughs> she came to me. <laughs> She came to me this week very concerned 
she was very concerned, and I have something to tell you, and uh, I was like, oh, man, this lady, what's happening? You know, she's resigning or what, you know? Right. And she was crying, and she said, look, I'm pregnant. I said, guys, what's, what's the problem with being pregnant, right? Uh, she, was, she was genuinely concerned um, about being pregnant. You know, it should not be this way, guys. I mean, it should not be this way, right? It's a joy moment, right? Not a concerning moment, right? But there's something about our culture which is uh, sometimes punishes, uh, you know, careers, etc. We don't believe on that, right? We believe in, in, in giving people freedom to express themselves, right? And the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we, uh, you know, we, we don't care too much about those things, right? We care that, uh, you know, in the end, people are living by the values that we believe in, right? Uh, and deliver results in the end, right? You can deliver great results working from the beach. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know how to do that, but, you know, if someone out Somebody there can, can do right? that, I'll be my guest, you know? <laughs> no problem at all. That's great. Um, I guess the, the, um, the, one of the things that MBA students are always really keen to hear about is career paths and how you made some of the decisions along the way. Take that anywhere you want. I don't know how you want to answer or talk about your own career, but when you, when you look back on it, how did you make decisions and how, do you, how did you end up where you are? I, I made good and bad decisions <laughs> on my career as, as I made every day on business, right? Um, look, looking back, right, and it was very easy to be the Monday morning quarterback, right? Oh, if I could only come back in time, nobody can, right? You have to make a decision and uh, live with the consequences, right? Um, and if I were in your shoes, uh, because you have such an advantage, advantageous uh, point, you know, standpoint, right? You guys are Wharton graduates to be, right? You know, the world is uh, out there waiting for you, right? It's fantastic. Um, so I wish I could come back 12 years in time. <laughs> uh, look, uh, here, here's my advice. Uh, find a place... Uh, where you spouse the values uh, of the place, right? Uh, it's very hard to, um, to, to be successful in a place where the values are different from yours, right? And what I'm telling is, of course, there's no such a place, ah, uh, this place is unethical. It doesn't exist. You know, every company is ethical. It's not the case. It's more about the style, right? You know, you know the, the, the little details that say, ah, this is... This is me, right? I, I could fit uh, in an environment like that. So find a place that you could fit, right? Because you, you have, you know, f for companies to be in business to begin with, they're good companies, right? You know, it's a competitive marketplace. So there is no such a thing as a lousy company. They, they don't last for long, right? They're all good companies out there. I, I would try to find uh, companies where I espouse the values, right? Uh, where I have a fit with the people. Right. Say, look, I, I can see myself working for or with uh, those people. I think that's important. Um, and a place that you can grow. You can do big things, right? Um, and that's a problem, right? Uh, and that's why I think a lot of people from business school end up uh, in consulting or banking. Because there, you know, they, they have a feeling that they can do big, big things, and they can, right? Uh, the problem with companies, like CPG companies, uh, usually is that um, people are not allowed to do big things, right? There is a, you know, a system and a, a governance and et cetera that prevents people from taking too, too many risks, right? We try to be the opposite. Uh, we try to place big bets on people, live with the consequences, and check every Monday uh, if things are working right. well. If they are not, we jump to help. Right. I would try to find that, uh, if I were me, uh, a place like that, spouse the values, not like the people, but, you know, see yourself working with those people, and uh, a place that you have the leeway to do something big, right? You know, life is short, I'm telling you. Twelve years go this way, uh, you know. And uh, my paradigm is that, uh, you know, a, a talented person can make an immediate impact on the business, right? You know, in six months, in one year, right? Someone working on the right way can do so much in our industry, right? Uh, so I'll look for a place like that, to be honest. 
Do you do anything tricky when you interview people? Are you, are you, do you have a question that you like to ask or a button you like to push on people to see how they respond? No, nothing, nothing, nothing tricky. I'm not, you know, I'm not smart enough to. Oh, you know. come on. It's, uh, you know, no hidden agendas. I, I, I try to assess exactly that. I try to assess, yeah. I try to assess values fit. Uh, and, and, and the best way to assess that is via examples, right? What you did right. so far and the decisions that we took and why, right? Um, you know, the way we screen people, the, the competency, the competency uh, uh, check is more or less taken care of. Right. right. You know, odds are that you take someone from, you know, a school like this, with exceptions, uh, you'll be someone very bright and, uh, you know, very, very accomplished, right? So, um, you know, uh, uh, that's the easy part. The tough part is to assess if this person will fit, right. uh, I think. Uh, that, that's where I try to concentrate. Right. And what happens if they don't fit? How do you, how do you manage that sort of thing if they don't seem to fit? For us, it's an issue, yeah. to be honest, right? Uh, uh, um, you know, we, we evaluate people based on, uh, of course, results, mm -hmm. right? Not that, that year results, but continued results and about potential and fit. Right. Uh, so what we say among us, uh, the leadership at Heinz, is that in, in a limit case, right, uh, we will fire the person who is uh, overly limiting the results, but not uh, according to our values. Mm -hmm. And the opposite, we would, you know, jump in to try to help and salvage someone that's struggling, and uh, but on the right way. Uh, we, we we believe very very strongly about that, to be honest. The way we the way we why, why we think this way is uh, one of our core values is uh, ownership and meritocracy. Um, so we want to have a company where we don't have people on the payroll. We want people who believe that they are and they will be owners of the company, right? And I'm telling you, it, it's, it's, it sounds like semantics, but makes a lot of difference uh, on the day to day. Why? Because owners, they'll do whatever it takes. They'll do anything, right? right? On a good way, right? On the, you know, according to the rules, but they'll, they'll do the extra mile. They'll do, you know, they do what it takes, right? Right? Is when uh, the analogy that we use there at times is when uh, there's a restaurant and uh, you know, uh, with the waitresses and all that, and the owner of the restaurant. There's a new restaurant across the street, right? Think about this. If the owner of the restaurant will be what concerned, right? Oh man, what's the, what's the menu? What's the price point? The quality of the food, etc. The waitresses, they're probably happy, right? You know, if this thing doesn't work out, you know, I go there, there's another restaurant, etc. We want to have, guys, uh, you know, at times, which is a tall order, restaurant owners working for us, all levels. Analysts, you know, managers, presidents, no matter, right? Uh, if we can achieve that, and it's a journey, right? Um, the company will be a special place. Um, uh, and then those big bets with people that we do, we do more, you know, certain that, you know, this person will succeed, right? Um, so, uh, I guess, in a nutshell, that's it. That's great. Um, I guess the last thing I'm going to ask before we open it up for questions is, you know, what advice do you have for these guys as they start out? You've already given a lot, but is there anything that you feel like you haven't hit on yet that you want to cover? before we open it up to Q&A. Oh, look, guys, uh, I'm not sure if I'm in a position to give advice to you guys, right? Uh, you guys are all very accomplished on, on your own ways, right? Um, you know, what you cannot lose perspective about is that um, you have a privilege to be here, right? It's a privilege. You are among the top 1% globally, right, of your peer group, right? Um, what I didn't know, right, when I was here is that um, you know, that uh, stamp, water and red, uh, uh, um, uh, it's not that it fades, it's always there, right? It's a stamp of excellence. But it's more powerful uh, uh, as soon as you get out of school, right? As time passes, this is not what's going to define you anymore, right? To be a nice to have, you know, ah, oh, no, water and red, great. But the defining thing is the experiences. And more importantly, accomplishments. Yes. You know, uh, I hire, I interview experienced people out of business school for you know, 10, 15, 20 years, right? You know, a, a nice, a fantastic uh, grad school experience is a nice to have, but it's all about what the person actually achieved, 
right? So I come back to my point. Go to a place where you can achieve big things, right? Those are the things that you define the professional that you will become, you know, after business school. And the, the more valuable will be, you know, the more achievements you have under your belt. That, 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 that That's be, great. That would be it. That's great. Thank you. All right. So now it's your turn. Who okay, had the first oh. question? <laughs> be gentle, guys. Yeah, you can breathe for a moment. Thanks for coming and talking to us. It's been really great. Uh, you mentioned Professor Haju. I'm having now a very good professor called David Bell about electronic sure. marketing. Sure. Uh, and I, w I had a dinner with him and we were talking and I was wondering how is electronic commerce and uh, electronic market marketing being uh, used by big CPGs that normally use traditional marketing channels. How are the CPGs going to cut the middleman? How do you see this going forward? Okay, very good question. We, we debate that uh, almost every day there. The, the issue is the following, right? Uh, let's separate the uh, electronic space for us in, in two, let's say, arenas, right? One is how you activate the brands and how you, you, you make an interaction with a consumer, right? So in that case, you know, we're embracing that like crazy, right? You know, I'll say, you know, double, double digits uh, uh, growth in investment on that space. Why? Because it's, you know, uh, is where people are, right? Where the audience is, right? You know, everybody now is work, watching TV with a laptop and doing other, uh, they, they are there. The brain has to be there. And it's a very unique way to interact. So that's happening. That's, that's not new, right? Um, what the industry is struggling still with the, on the, is on the other side, which is to use electronic commerce to fulfill an order and deliver products, right? Because the economics are atrocious, right? So how you deliver milk and ketchup to your door uh, uh, economically is a huge challenge, right? Economically, right? So, and you have you know, very able uh, players like Amazon trying to do that for a while, right? And, uh, and right now, only now, after eight years in Seattle, expanding to another city, it's a, it's a struggle, right? I don't see the industry uh, disintermediating the, uh, the middleman in that case, right? Because the, the fundamental issue is how the consumer buys, right? And the consumer wants a consolidator, right? I, I don't want to go to a site to buy ketchup and another site to go milk and this site to, to go bread and then all these things will come to my house. There should, there should be some sort of one-stop shop that consolidates this and delivers, right? So I don't see the industry going this way. I see the retailers eventually cracking the code, right? Walmart, is I was in Bentonville last week. They are testing the new uh, delivery system where you order and you go pick up on a sort of drive through kind of thing. That exists in Tesco in the UK already. Uh, they're testing the US uh, right now, which, which is promising, right? So now the consumer does the last mile and the economics of the last mile. But the, the first part interaction uh, with the brands digitally, it's huge for, for all of our brands. And it's, it's becoming more and more important, to be honest. Professor Bell, I remember. You had him Great as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. How do you differentiate the fact that Heinz condiments are, are generally not consumed on their own? They're, you know, I'm running ketchup by itself. So how, do you, how does that kind of change your strategy when you really have to pair ketchup or other condiments with, with another food? That's a, that's a very fundamental question. Um, so in the end, if you are in the condiments business, in, the, in this case of uh, ketchup, right, you have to bet on the host foods that you want to, uh, to pair with, to, to use your term. I think you're very right. Um, funny enough, uh, talking about the U.S., right, um, the host foods that people uh, prefer here, they didn't change much in the, in the past 20 years. Right? The number one host food in this country is cold sandwiches. And it's been the demo one for 20 years. Right, which is very funny, right? It's very minimal uh, fluctuations there in preferences. Um, having said that, uh, um, to your question, which is a fundamental question, is uh, to we, in which host foods you want to bet on, right, to attack? I, I, was, I was discussing the, the ketchup flavors uh, before, right? Uh, you know, on the heart of the flavor strategy, 
is a, is a host foods question, the, way, the, one, the one you just posed. Why um, ketchup is the preferred condiment but doesn't go in some, in, into some host foods in some occasions? Um, so we said, you know, how could we uh, attack, how can we uh, participate, is a better word, um, <laughs> on the breakfast occasion with ketchup? Because people really don't, don't eat ketchup here on breakfast, right? It's, of course, a huge occasion. So ketchup with uh, jalapeno spices, we are selling that on restaurants as a breakfast condiment. You know, to eat with eggs and sausages, etc. So suddenly, it's a, it's a completely different avenue of growth for a brand that's established, but do, did not participate on a given occasion or a given host food. So um, you're very right. It's a best on, bet on host foods and uh, how you know, best you can fit there and pair with them. It's, it's our day-to-day -day, uh, challenge. I have a four-year-old who believes that everything is a host food for ketchup. He just... <laughs> Everything's better with ketchup in his well, world. God bless. He'll Fantastic. be thrilled that I'm <laughs> talking to you Absolutely. <laughs> More power to him. Right. <laughs> I just had a question about uh, innovation. So we had Bernardo here some weeks ago, and he also told that innovation is a very essential part of the company and for the, great for the, the growth strategy is really important. Yeah. And I wanted to know, how do you innovate concerning like, the main products or the ketchup? And how do you innovate, like going to new categories, and how, does, how do you balance this, this whole process? Very good question. We call renovate the core, or you know, going to white spaces, right? Um, yeah, you know, it's a very fundamental question again. Uh, um, the, the way we think about it is the following, um, uh, at least in my experience, right? Those white spaces, they're very tricky, because they look promising, they look great, right? Then you do the math. When you do the math, then they are not so great when you do the right math, right? Why? Because there's more, right? So the balance is, you know, how can you leverage and sweat your assets? And the best assets that we have, besides the people, is our brands, right? And to make sure that uh, that brand can go to that space with minimal effort, right? So come back to your question, right? How can the Heinz brand, right, enter the, the breakfast occasion with minimum effort? The minimum effort is the maximum ROI, right? Um, I think that's, that's the holy grail, that's the trick. That's the balance that I'm trying to find every day, right? Because I, I, I'll tell you, you know, to launch new brands, it's such a hassle, right? And such a gamble. Right? And sometimes you succeed, but I'm telling you, you know, it's almost like a, a coin flip. It's, it's tough. And there's a lot of money on the line, right? So I'm always uh, in favor of uh, leveraging our current assets and bringing them to spaces that are, you know, adjacent to the core and growing this way, like an onion strategy, right? Then to say, oh, you know what, now I'm going to take the Heinz brand to, you know, uh, Binks, whatever. And it's a leap. When you do a leap, you increase your risk, and uh, my experience is that the ROI is, uh, you know, so-so. Those guys fight with me every day about that uh, back in Heinz. You know, it's a, it's a discussion. I know that you're responsible for America, um, United States, and Canada, but my question is, like, in terms of expansion, um, which regions or which countries do you expect to have growth in the next five, 10 years. Um, and then if you see uh, any, any kind of, um, if, you, if, you, if you think that any kind of, any specific region will have some specific like challenge. I don't know if I was clear. Sure, so, so the first question is uh, uh, where we see uh, you know, the company going, right? In which, which countries? Look, uh, we are already growing you know, very rapidly in the emerging world, right? Uh, double digits in Latin America, right? We did a big acquisition in Brazil two years ago, um, in Asia, of course, right? But uh, you know, the, the amount of white spaces and big countries that we have minimal presence is staggering. So it's a huge opportunity. Mexico, right? It's the top 
15 GDP in the world, and the, you know, we, we, ha we barely have any presence there. It's across, across the door, right? And nobody's supposed to from Mexico, but you know. <laughs> Soon enough. <laughs> Soon enough. <Yet. laughs> um, you know, Asia, you know, China, right? The size of China, our business is tiny there for the size of the GDP. So, you know, we, we have like growth avenues on emerging markets, uh, you know, for the next five, 10 years easily, right? Having said that, the biggest opportunity that we have, I think that's your second question, is here, is in North America. Why? Because it's the best margin structure, right? So, you know, is where we can grow the business in a more healthy way, where the ROIs of the bets that we'll place, uh, you know, the odds that they'll pay back quicker, and uh, for sure, they're just higher, right? So I do this propaganda every day there to, uh, to my boss and to the board that, uh, you know, North America is the place that we should grow, and we are doing that as we speak, so it's good. The question about the definition of success for a brand, uh, I always say uh, price and power, right? I have a gentleman here on the, on the room, Marcelo, a Wharton grad also, uh, uh, working for us there. And what those guys are doing there in terms of, uh, you know, generating value out of the pricing power of our brands, guys, it's amazing, right? It's a purely analytical exercise, right? I don't know what those guys are, you know, uh, having, but the models are uh, scary, right? Um, but again, you know, we're trying to, 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 to stretch the limits because the model has to work, right? We're putting money behind the brands. And I, I'm telling you, the, the way we're doing that is, you know, it's doubling down on everything. So take the Heinz brand. This year, for instance, we're increasing the media investment uh, behind the Heinz brand fivefold versus the, past, the average of the past five years, right? That investment has to pay off, right? It's not only more sales, but more pricing power. That's what Marcel is leading there. Again, talking about uh, uh, doing big things, <laughs> he's doing something very big there, right? So I see that as organic growth also, right? It's always the top line and the bottom line. I'd like to hear a little bit more about the role of leadership. So how do you manage to translate all those values of the organization, the, the attributes of the brand, in an organization that actually have thousands of employees yeah. distributed across geographies with different uh, cultural backgrounds? How, how can you actually navigate from the top executives to all employees on the, the manufacturing plants in, across the, the organization? No, it's, it's a very good question. It is a challenge, right? The, the way we, we do it there, it's very, I think, commonsensical, right? One is um, the leadership has to embody the values, right? It, it would be strange if the leaders, they, they behave differently from what we, we preach. So that's obvious, but uh, sometimes in some companies that's not true, <laughs> right? Um, so we are very, we are very strict uh, on this. Secondly, I, I truly believe in being out there right? Uh, being out there mean, you know, being out there physically, right? So I, uh, I am on somewhere almost every week, right? Somewhere could be a plant, could be an, a sales office, could be, you know, so that you are visible to, to people. And we think that's powerful, right? It's, it's old fashioned, but it's powerful. People see you, hear you, ask questions, etc. So every, every goal, we, we, we stop for, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes for a Q&A with whoever, you know, is, is there in that site. And that's powerful, right? Then we do something neat, which is our principles are so simple. It's, you know, I mentioned meritocracy and ownership, uh, quality, innovation, consumer first, integrity. We splashed those principles everywhere. So every wall, in every <laughs> office, in every plant, uh, we have these things, you know, written across the board, et cetera. So people have the look and feel and a constantly reminder uh, of this. F finally, uh, what we do, uh, and I think that's unique, is you know, uh, we evaluate people based on these things. So they become real in the sense they have teeth, right? So you know, that, that person is a fantastic you know, brand manager, deliver all the results, uh, group market share, et cetera, but there are principles that he or she is not embracing. To be a problem. Uh, 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 and uh, he or she will know uh, uh, about that, right? So those things come, you know, very alive 
in that sense. But it's a constant challenge, right? How you do that to, in our case, almost 5,000 people in North America, it's, it's a challenge. One of, one of um, the most interesting topics I've studied uh, at Wharton was change management. And you are leading a huge change at Heinz, and I'm part of that process as well. But what lessons can you give uh, for, for us here uh, that someday will be, at hope of, hopefully, at those positions, uh, cha uh, leading change? So what have you learned at, in, at Heinz that you could give us lessons? Okay, good. Well, tough question. Marcelo put me on a tough spot here on the final question. <laughs> no, guys, you know, uh, one, I think you have to, to have a sense of purpose, right? I think that's the most important part, to be honest. Um, we published our sense of purpose almost day zero, uh, you know, a little bit more than one year ago. We want to be the best food company growing a better world. That's our purpose, right? Best food company means the most efficient and the most respected, right? In terms of reputation, in terms of what the products are. So, you know, there, there's a, there are blind tests for our key brands. If they are not number one, we fail, right? <laughs> and everything's a you know, consequence of this failure. Growing a better world means that, uh, you know, on, on the societies that, to, uh, communities that we operate, we have a responsibility, right? And, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, let's hug a tree or I'm, I'm saying, you know, let's, Let's do something. Let's do our part. Uh, and something that has mean, meaning, right? Not, not, not just, oh, let's feel good about it. Let's, let's do something that could make a difference. So in our case, we, we embraced uh, the, um, you know, Fight the Hunger uh, campaign uh, globally with UNICEF. And we put everything, all the programs that we have behind this program, right? It's about, you know, uh, feeding kids in Africa. No. I think that the, the propose, right, uh, does not resonate with everybody, of course. People are different, right? Something that works for me doesn't work for you. But we believe that if the propose is clear, what we're trying to achieve, this will energize, you know, a lot of people to say, you know what, I want to be part of this story, right? I want to create and build this company uh, and be part of this, this journey. So that, that's one. The second is to be legit, right? To say, look, we have a set of principles and we believe on them and we live and, you know, abide by them every day. And it's so easy to see companies don't doing that. People say things but behave differently, right? Uh, and people see that, right? It's so easy to see. So we, we, we believe that if you are consistent with the things that you preach, right? Uh, and they don't have to be like, you know, uh, mad scientist kind of things, just basic stuff, right? Integrity, consumer first, quality, innovation, ownership, meritocracy. We do that every day for a long time. People know what to expect. And when they know what to expect, they know the rules of the game. And when they know, they, they know the rules of the game and the game is fair, it's played on the field, not off the field, etc. cetera. Um, my sense is that people want to be part of that. And then change management becomes easier. People want to follow this and say, I can go there because I know what to expect, right? So sense of purpose and clear rules, simple rules that we enforce every day by example. Uh, to me, that's the best way to do any, any sort of change management. Long answer, sorry. That was a great answer. <laughs> Eduardo, I just want to thank you for sharing your Wharton story with us. Everyone, can we give him a big round of applause? Thank you, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.